Good morning to the first folks who are joining us. Thank you for, uh, for joining our webinar today with Melina Labucan Massimo and Peter Kirby. I'm Kai Nagata from Dogwood and I'll be your moderator today. And uh, we'll meet our panel in just a moment. I wanted to say first that I'm speaking to you from Gixan territory in Northern BC. And uh, I see folks joining from all over the province. And so I would just invite you, if you're not on your own territory, to reflect on whose land you're sitting on this morning and what it will take for control um, and ownership of that land to return uh, to the people um, whose land you're on. So today's webinar is about power. Uh, it's about communities reclaiming their power, harnessing clean energy on their territories to build a foundation for the life they want for their people. And there's lessons to be learned from these projects and a real urgency, I would say, to, uh, to scale up that work as we rebuild from this pandemic in the middle of, as we all know, a rapidly accelerating climate crisis. So joining us to share their experience and their knowledge today are Melina and Peter. Thank you both so much for making time. Thank you for having us, Kai. Thank you. So this has been a painful few weeks um, in the midst of a, of a difficult year. I'm talking about the ongoing uh, police killings of black and indigenous people in Canada the toll that that takes on communities, and the debate that it has opened up around systemic racism in all of our institutions. And um, I wanted to quote uh, an article from a marine biologist and climate expert in the States um, who is named Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, and she's black, and she writes about the project that she hasn't been able to complete uh, since the police uh, killed George Floyd. Uh, she talks about a policy memo to Congress about wind power, uh, a grant proposal to fund a network of, of women climate leaders. And she says, I work on one existential crisis, but I can't concentrate because of another. And speaking about racial inequality and climate change, she says, if we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. And I was wondering if either of you uh, were willing to reflect on that before we start our discussion of the specific projects that we wanna look at today in BC. I will defer to my elder Peter if he wants to go first, or I can too, but. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Melina. I was waiting for you. Uh, I was uh, preferred to be uh, second or last. Um, those are um, uh, very big uh, issues, of course. And uh, it, you know, racism is the lived existence of, uh, you know, all of us. And it's a matter of what side of the racism that you're on. Uh, you know, yesterday in Adlin, I went into a local store, uh, a restaurant to order uh, a little bit of food. And a woman in there who had said to me uh, some months ago, uh, she said to me in a public meeting, Peter, you don't hire enough white people. Uh, she was in the store uh, and she looked at me in uh, what I can only describe as a special way. Um, it was very uncomfortable. Uh, she's an elder, elderly woman. Uh, and, you know, you go about your business and live your life and get stuff done. Uh, but this is part of our lived existence. Um, uh, some folks aren't going to change, uh, but the younger generation, I think, better educated, more aware, our society changes. Uh, in all of it, there's opportunity, and uh, a big piece of that opportunity, in my uh, opinion, is what's articulated in the Harvard Project some uh, 25, 26 years ago, uh, that says empowering Indigenous communities and allowing them uh, to be their own decision makers. Uh, is key. And so th those two things in my own lived experience um, do absolutely reflect uh, what you said, Kai. Thank you, Peter. Um, Melina, did you have any thoughts on just the link between climate change and, uh, and racial inequality in Canada? Mm, yeah, these are big questions, Kai. Um, climate change is, is the 
um, kind of mega storm that we're all in and COVID-19 is a big issue also that we're, you know, as she said, an existential crisis that I think we're all facing right now. Um, but I think everyone is impacted differently by um, COVID-19 as well as, as Peter says, as with racism. I think all of us are affected by racism in Canada and in the U.S., but I think all of us have lived experiences of what that feels like um, on our bodies differently because of what side we're on of experiencing that racism. Um, and I think for, I think it's important for us as we move forward for all of us to be aware that it is not an issue that's gonna go away by itself, but it's something that we have to deal with in confronting very real and uncomfortable truths about the society that we live in. And I think it, it starts with truth telling and, and it starts with um, getting to places where we can face those uncomfortable truths so we can get to the other side of that and how we do healing. But I think it's a very difficult thing to do um, if people aren't willing to address the, they lived in real exist, existence and realities that Indigenous peoples and Black peoples face in this country every single day in terms of what violence looks like on our, looks like on our bodies. Um, you know, from a very young age, one of my first memories of in Northern Alberta is is one of racism, unfortunately, and um, from other kids that I that were that I was in um, day school with and place in in um, in daycare with, and and I think you know that was a learned experience, a learned um, judgment that the other children were learning from their families and from their parents. So I think it's something that. Is slowly changing, like Peter said, as we um, continue to have better forms of education and in historical accuracies in the history of what really happened to Indigenous peoples and Black people in this country. Um, I think the more that we understand the lived and shared histories um, that have been kept out of the history books as we continue to learn the, the true history of this country, then I think that's when we'll start to see better um, better place, people coming from better places of understanding, compassion, love and care for one another as neighbors. Thank you both. And um, I, I wanna thank you, Melina, for, uh, for your work and for the incredible um, achievement that is the release of your show, uh, Power to the People, and what you've done to give people the microphone and, and give them a platform to tell their stories all across Canada um, in communities that, um, that, that you've, given us a window into uh, the work that's happening. So thank you uh, and congratulations on the release of the show. And we're gonna put our first uh, poll up on the screen just to see um, whether folks have had a chance to check the show out. And we'll give you uh, links at the end for uh, where to, to view the, uh, the show that Melina has, uh, is hosting on APTN, Power to the People. Um, and Melina, I wanted to ask, uh, you, know, you visited dozens of communities across BC and Canada. Uh, learning about renewable energy projects, but also people's languages and territories. And I just wanted to ask, what was the best part for you about the experience of filming the show? For me, it was just seeing the immense leadership that exists within communities, um, that exists within Indigenous communities. And that's why I'm so happy Peter has joined us today, um, because he, amongst many other communities, just show the, the vast ex expertise and the vast knowledge and the vast love that people have for their communities and, and what that takes to be able to get people to implementation of these amazing renewable energy, food security, um, eco housing, um, climate change adaptation projects that um, are being implemented from coast to coast. Um, the, the 26 locations that we were able to visit was just a like just a drop in the bucket of 20 over 2300 projects that exist in indigenous communities from coast to coast so it's it's an amazing thing and so that's why um power of the people is such kind of a novelty because it because i don't think people know that these types of projects actually exist aren't already up and running have taken communities off communities off of diesel um and uh, you know you'll see other examples that will that will play shortly here but i think it's just for me it was 
the passion and the inspiration and the, of the people, but also similar to what we were talking about earlier is that it shows the history of each community. It talks about the challenges of the communities and the communities identifying challenges that they're very, very intimately aware of, but also what those solutions are for those communities because they, they know the problem so well, so therefore that they, they know the solutions from within the community. And I think for me, that's what the most exciting thing was is that it, it helps people have inspiration and hope and a beacon for the future, but also um, really gives people insight into what it's like to be in an Indigenous community and what the communities are grappling with and also gives you insight into the history and the resiliency of Indigenous peoples across this country. Well, thank you for creating um, more pandemic content for people to stream at home. If you haven't seen the show yet, uh, you can watch it on AVTN. You can also uh, view it on their streaming service, which is called Lumi. Um, and you can follow uh, Melina and the show on Facebook and Instagram and see little clips there to whet your appetite. But for the moment, let's, um, let's play a clip from the introduction of one of the episodes so you can get a, uh, a sense of the show. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll play a clip from Power to the People. like it froze maybe. Our prophecies teach us of a time to come when the earth will be ravaged and mankind cease to exist. Now the gifts of Mother Earth must bring power to the people and lead us on a path to a post-carbon future. Jamie, I don't think we can see it. We weren't able to see the video, but we could hear the intro. We'll, we'll play another clip in a moment, but um, let's start in the community of, uh, of Kanakabar in the, the Fraser Canyon. Um, and I wanted to ask Melina, this is, uh, if you're driving between Hope and uh, Lytton, it's, uh, it's in the, the canyon on the way up the highway there. And I wanted to ask what you found um, when you visited the community of Kanakabar. Um, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it's such a beautiful territory. Um, one of the things that I found as somebody that comes from a very cold region was that it was so, so hot in the summer and I've never felt such heat in anywhere in Canada. Um, we were filming in 42 degree weather every day. So as you can imagine, it was, you're just like, every time you're outside, you're dropping, you're dropping sweat, which I'm not used to. Um, and especially not filming, but, um, the, because the community is so aware of climate change impact because they're already feeling immense heat like that every summer and extending days and days longer every and every summer they're doing climate change adaptation studies water studies around kind of the ebb and flow of their streams and water systems and they've implemented a run of the river system and then what we'll see in these videos is that um, it will that we will see uh, food security projects um, around chickens food forests um, and they've already implemented a number of solar installations um, so I and green and there we're building a greenhouse so I think it's just for me it's just the ingenuity of indigenous people and of the leadership and of the young people they're, they're training young people at the same time they have summer students every summer um, that are learning about the water um, testing but as well as learning how to take care of chickens learning how to build greenhouses it's for me it was just amazing because you're already very aware of the impact of climate Climate change, but you're also very aware of the um, what they're already doing to ensure that they're food secure, to ensure that their community is taken care of, um, especially in places you know during times like this with a pandemic, but also in future pandemics and potentially food and water shortages. So it just felt like a community that was looking at climate preparedness, preparedness that um, other communities, um, indigenous or non-indigenous, are not at this time. So it was just it was an inspiring place to be. All right, well, let's take a look at the um, Kanaka Bar episode from Power to the People. We'll do a screen share so you can see the video. And we'll play clip number two, uh, Jamie. It's summer in BC's Fraser River Canyon, the hottest place in Canada. For countless generations, this territory has sustained the people of Kanaka Bar, but now climate change is clouding their future. 
I've come to see why this community is earning national praise for their efforts to achieve energy and food independence. Let's go ahead, we'll roll the second clip as well, and, uh, and we can get a look at the, the food security operations, the greenhouse, and, uh, and how that integrates with their um, solar energy plan. Our first things that we had going. Do you always wear these? Um, no, actually, these, these are really friendly. Amazing. Right now, they're um, filling it up with honey and making sure that they're getting ready for the winter time. So how many chickens do you have in here? We have 50, I believe. We started out with six and realized, um, you know, this is working. We can keep on growing and become a larger scale. So you have a student youth program. Can you tell me more about it and how many students that are currently in it? There's six, six oh, okay. students here. So great. So coming around the chickens here, hello ladies. We walk into our food forest. Wow. So you know, everything in our garden has a purpose, whether that's food or medicinal. Um, these here are linden trees and they're actually one of the few trees that we can eat the meat. It's beautiful up here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is echinacea. There's lots and lots of stuff. A large, large variety of plants. I'm going to say over 90 plants. You can really see the diversity here. The overall plan is that this food is a food forest and not necessarily a garden. So we don't have to have a lot of membership coming in, weeding, fertilizing. The general plan for this is to see, you know, what we can grow here and what's suitable to, you know, grow on a larger scale. And one of the main things are these strawberries that are going to remain growing here. Coming over here, you can see these guys working hard. It's our first adventure into creating a greenhouse. What we're creating here is called a solar thermal greenhouse. It's important that we use the solar thermal greenhouse because of the extremities of the weather changes. So in the winter time, it can get up to like minus 30, while in the summertime, it can get beyond like 45 degrees Celsius. This is amazing. All in like one little plot of land. I'm so inspired by just the diversity of what you have here. Not even to mention, you have. We have solar in the background here we haven't even talked about so i'd like to hear more about that when we get a chance yeah i'll tell you all about it later there's so much going on here that clip just it just makes me so happy every time i watch it seeing how all those pieces fit together and um just how how excited she is to to show you uh what's going on so She's 18, like that's amazing, <laughs> you know, like an 18 year old being like that aware of what's happening, I think is just for me really hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the solar panels that you showed, um, my understanding is that they, they displace some of the, the power usage um, in the band administration buildings because in Kanaka Bar, they are hooked up to the BC grid, right? Like they do have power lines that connect them into the rest of, of BC. Um, so their energy projects are either displacing that energy use or they're supplementing, they're selling back power to the grid. But there are other communities in BC that don't have that option, that are essentially not connected to the BC grid and are, are facing a different set of, of challenges. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about the communities that you visited that, um, that are off the grid, that are trying to generate their own power? Yeah, I mean, I think, and that's the biggest question I, for, for me that, and I'm sure Peter can, was definitely the expert on, <clears throat> on this question specifically, but um, what my understanding is from talking with communities from coast to coast that it's, it's always, can we connect to grid? And if we can't connect to grid, then let's do off-grid connections. And so I think what I've seen is that communities are either doing off-grid connections where they can, which Peter can talk about of getting 100% off diesel, which his community he has been successful in doing. And then also <clears throat> other communities that I've been to in Ontario are actually looking at grid systems where they're doing a microgrid um, sharing system. So they're having 300 kilowatts of solar go up, but they're, so they, when they're producing enough energy, they can shut down their diesel, but when they're not producing enough solar energy, they, the diesel turns back on. So it's like this kind of shared system, but it really helps displace the amount. So I think um, there's so much to say about this question, but I, but really the biggest question is, is if communities are not c connected or close enough to a grid system, therefore they cannot connect. So they have to look at other um, ways to be able to connect to systems, to a grid system. Um, and also, unfortunately, what we've seen in BC, which I think is, is a major issue that folks within BC need to know about that I've spoke to with communities in BC is, is that some communities like Kanakabar have been able to connect to grid and been able to um, 
have their first installation of Run of the River connect to the BC grid. But because of bigger projects, um, the mega projects like the Site C Dam, which are much different. So Run of the River is a much different type of setup, less disturbance, um, uses a, like a, a pen hole, which Peter can talk about and it drops down and it uses already like, um, I'll, I'll let Peter talk about it, but it, it uses, a, it has a lot less disturbance. And so a lot of First Nation communities have, that I went to from Squamish Nation to um, Nichon, the Nichon, the Tulukwe Nation, um, Kanakabar, um, have all been able to connect to Britain. And then also Judith Sayers, who is like one of the first chiefs that in BC to be able to do this type of technology in two, around 2000s, early 2000s, who was like a pioneer and leader in this. Um, so we have been able to connect to grid, but unfortunately because of the Site C Dam, because of the large capacity now communities are being told that they're not allowed to connect to grid. And so I think this is a major issue where communities that want to create energy independence, create energy democracy, um, create um, the ability to have their own systems within their own communities, within their own jurisdictions, are not able to connect to grid because of bigger mega dams like Site C, which have bigger disturbances, all the, all the issues that I'm sure a lot of Dogwood, the Dogwood audience knows about, but communities are now being bumped and taken off the ability to connect. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Kai, because you heard that a couple of communities haven't been able to, but that's what I've been told as well. Yeah, definitely. And there's there's even more uh, perverse examples. Like, let's talk about Haida Gwaii. Um, BC Hydro operates on Haida Gwaii, but they operate at a loss because they, they have to ship hundreds of thousands of, of barrels of diesel over to the islands to burn in diesel generators in order to sell that power. And it's so expensive to ship it and burn it that they lose money, but they would rather sort of keep that monopoly on the, the customers on Haida Gwaii um, than just simply make it uh, possible for people to generate their own power. But it sounds like the Haida uh, nation is um, is pushing back against that and they're, they're building out their own renewable um, capacity without support from BC Hydro. Um, can you talk about what you found in Haida Gwaii? Yeah, so like you said, Haida Gwaii is not connected to grid. Um, and so they're using so much diesel. And so there is the both of the um, chief um, systems. So in Skidigit and in Masset, um, and also the Haida Nation um, are looking at different ways. So they've implemented solar in different community centers and health um, um, not health buildings, but community centers and um, community, yeah, community gatherings places. But also, they're yeah, they they haven't been able to get off diesel, so um, they're also utilizing it um, in nor in small northern remote. Um, cultural camp, cultural areas, sacred sites, essentially to not bring in diesel into those areas as well and have, you know, more diesel spills um, like we've seen more recently up in Alaska, another spill. Um, so communities are really looking at ways to get off of diesel in Haida Gwaii. And so we're going to, I know we're going to show another clip, so I, I don't yeah. want to speak too much to it and like ruin it all, but there's a lot of work that's happening in Haida Gwaii as well. Yeah, let's, let's watch the next clip from uh, Power to the People from the uh, Haida Gwaii episode. What I see is panels behind me, which is pretty amazing to see the camp starting to implement that. This is the first summer that they're up and in place and actually powering the camp. So those six panels, I think it's about 1.5 kilowatts, um, managed to cover the camp's electrical needs here. So much sense that you would utilize something like solar here to go back to the way your ancestors lived here in your homeland. It's a fantastic feeling to actually see something that was just the seed of an idea a couple of years ago. Um, and then actually seeing something come to fruition like this, it's, it's amazing. It's all about respect. The solar panels are like a great way of showing respect to our environment. The energy is just going by us every day, like the sun's shining down, the wind's flowing past, the tide's coming up, and we can capture that. That's like more traditionally the way it should be. How does it feel being out here? I love it. The satisfaction of knowing that we're all involved with trying to make a difference to our to our homeland by looking at our carbon footprint. I want my people to go on living for thousands of years and to experience the world that I've been so privileged to live in. I keep saying to the youth, we have to hang on to hope. Wonderful clip there from uh, Barbara Wilson. And um, so Haida Gwaii is, is in the middle of their journey to, uh, to getting off of diesel and going 100% renewable, but there are communities that have already paved the way. And so I wanted to bring in um, Peter, uh, Peter Kirby, to talk about his experience in Atlin. 
And uh, just before we get to uh, to Peter, he's in Atlin, just south of the uh, of the Yukon border. I want to ask our participants, um, what's the farthest north you've ever been in BC? So we'll put our second poll up on the screen, and uh, and I'll ask Peter to tell us about Atlin and what the energy situation was like there, say twelve or fifteen years ago. Yeah, thank you, Kai. Um, I'm interested to see the poll of. Uh how many people have been uh, how far north. Uh, when I lived in the Lower Mainland, a lot of people I met hadn't been beyond hope. Uh, but uh, Atlan, Sunny Atlan, uh, 12 years ago, we were burning over a million liters of diesel uh, every year, uh, putting tons of uh, 4,400 uh, tons of greenhouse gases uh, into the air every year. Uh, Tech River Clinket First Nation uh, worked uh, collaboratively, I'll say, with, uh, we, we won a RFP that BC Hydro uh, put out, um, and then worked collaboratively with BC Hydro to build uh, what our installed capacity is today in a modified run of river uh, project, a 2.1 megawatt uh, project that uh, we deliver all of the electrons in our homeland to all constituents in our homeland. Um, so we have an energy purchase agreement with uh, BC Hydro, uh, and they uh, sell that energy that we sell to them. They sell to everybody here, including myself, I pay BC Hydro. Um, and uh, so that relationship has worked out uh, wonderfully. We've operated uh, last year. Uh, we uh, um, celebrated 10 years of successful operation. Um, and, you know, uh, we're starting to work on another project. That's incredible. So you you went from 100% diesel power. So every freezer in the community, every every light, every uh, computer was running off of diesel. And now you're not only generating enough to supply uh, Clingit needs, but you're also supplying that power to all of your your neighbors, your white neighbors. Uh, so that's an incredible turnaround. I, I I wanted to ask you what the biggest what the biggest changes are that you've noticed in the community since that shift in the uh, in the energy uh, underpinnings? Yeah, Kai, this, you know, um, of course the biggest thing is that, you know, we don't hear the diesels running in town anymore. Uh, we're not emitting the GHGs. Uh, what that means for uh, people in the community uh, is uh, many uh, Tech River Clinket people, when we went commercial operation on April 1st, 2009, um, celebrated and just pride. You know, people, uh, some people in our community, um, of course, uh, struggle, uh, but the pride that we've, we saw initially and has been sustained um, uh, over time uh, is amazing. And it's an interesting thing for me because um, uh, I've never really uh, witnessed or thought much about how important self-pride is for uh, capacity development, for who I think I am today and how that empowers me to be able to do things and take on challenges. So these ripple effects that happen in communities when there is uh, ownership of infrastructure, uh, people know, uh, that, you know, we can, we, Tack River Clinkets, we Indigenous people can do things uh, after, uh, you know, generations of suppression uh, to come out of that uh, and see that, okay, despite that, we can do these things. Uh, and so uh, one of the clearest indicators that I had was an individual in our community who would not make eye contact. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying it's totally the Hydro Project, but that and other uh, work in the community, uh, I'll say it was uh, perhaps a tipping point that, um, you know, individuals can make eye contact, can dream. You know, it, it's a funny thing to say that somebody can dream today um, and couldn't before, uh, but that, that's, that's a fact. Those are facts. And so um, a huge change that way there's still lots of work to be done. Make no mistake. There's still lots of work to be done. Uh, and we need to do more. We need to achieve, uh, uh, like we have with the Hydro Project, 100% ownership. 
we need to achieve 100% ownership of our decision making for ourselves, for our future generations. Thank you. Well, let's, let's take a visit. I was actually pleased to see in the poll that over half the people who participated said that they have been uh, as far north as the, as the Yukon border. So the territory and the landscape is not completely unfamiliar. But let's show uh, the, the Taku River episode and uh, we'll see a little clip of um, some of Peter's projects in action. Today, I'm going out to the various clean energy projects and I'm excited to learn more about their hydro and something called geo-exchange and also meet the people behind the projects that are citizens from the Taku River Clean Hey guys, this is Melina, this is Peter, this is TJ. Had a little outage this morning, so uh, we shut down and need to fire back up, so they're quick. The guys are in from East Lake already. Oh yeah, okay. Phone them at 8.30, they're already here. Sorry. Now, there's a number of hardworking people in this community, both Clingit and non clingit and collectively we work together to uh, affect change in our community. The hydro project, the geothermal, the retrofits, uh, and other community projects are, are part of that combined effort. What I found in mainstream society was not taught to us in the school, what we need to survive. So when we reached 16, we were just let go. In the case of residential school, I was taken away for 10 years. Help give me back five so that I can turn around and give that back to our youth. Okay, the next thing I gotta do is I gotta go in from Droop to ISOC, but I'm waiting for it to come down a bit more around 60. So I keep in control by lowering this button here. How long have you been doing it for, TJ? 10 years. Wow. He knows what he's doing, eh? So it took eight years to get it in place, and now it's been running for 10 years. So basically, you've been working on this project for 18 years. Uh, it's just beautiful to me. It just really is. It's, it's amazing. Yes. When you are engaged and active in doing something, that is healing. One of the things that Canadians would be well served in is believing in Indigenous people, in trusting that fairness and equity in our society is better for all of us, not just for Indigenous people, but for all of us. Because this is where the real power comes from, it's just dropped down the hill. And uh, you can see the creek. Yeah. Right there, where oh, we're, yeah. Uh, water goes back into the creek. So this is where the drop off happens to generate the electricity. If this project help your community and the town of Atlin get off diesel. 100% off diesel. That's amazing. How many homes does that heat? Close to 300 homes. I think the last count was 273 or 277 homes. It's uh, about 4,100 tons of greenhouse gas reduction annually. You make the point in that clip, Peter, about um, about equity and, and justice being good for everybody in, in society. And uh, I think that's a really important point to underscore. You mentioned your upcoming plans. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you've got in the works and, and, and your vision for the next few years when it comes to renewable power? Oh yeah, Kai, thanks. Uh, so uh, we're working now on a, a new project. Our first project was 2.1 megawatts. Uh, this will be a 8.5 uh, megawatt uh, wow. combined capacity. Uh, it'll consist of two uh, powerhouses, one that'll be right beside our existing, that'll be around 5.7 uh, megawatts, and a lower powerhouse uh, further downstream will re reuse the same water uh, and generate more electricity a little further downstream. Uh, that will connect to a 69 kilovolt uh, transmission line that will run from sunny app in British Columbia uh, north about 90 kilometers to uh, Jake's Corner, Yukon, and connect to the Yukon grid. Um, so uh, in that project, um, you know, we're working closely with Yukon government as well as BC government and Canada uh, uh, to help uh, reduce, uh, I think we'll be looking at around 22,000 uh, tons of greenhouse gases uh, there. And, uh, you know, super economic driver in the region, uh, those 50% who've been north uh, will know that um, things are a long ways apart up here. Um, you know, if you got in your vehicle in Vancouver and started driving, um, 22 hours later, you might be in Winnipeg and go another five hours and you'd make it to Atlin if you took different roads. Um, but anyways, we're, uh, we're working on that uh, project where uh, everything is shaping up very well. 
Uh, we, uh, as a proponent of the project, uh, Clingit Homeland Energy, uh, have submitted uh, to uh, Taku River Clingit First Nation government and BC government, the, the environmental uh, work and uh, seeking permits from both governments. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my optimistic uh, view is that uh, in 2024, uh, we'll be uh, helping Yukon get off uh, diesel energy as well. That's incredible. And the scale of it is something that I don't know if um, people down south have really wrapped their heads around. But um, the idea that you could be generating enough power in your homelands to help uh, decarbonize another province is, uh, is incredibly impressive. So we know that as uh, we shift transportation and home heating to electricity, that as we see more uh, battery operated trucks and trains and cars, and we see more uh, electric heat pumps in houses instead of uh, oil furnaces, that we are going to need more electrons uh, in British Columbia. And yet there's a real reluctance um, by BC Hydro to, uh, to sign energy purchase agreements with indigenous communities to, to sanction the development of, uh, of new uh, generation projects. Can you talk, Peter or Melina, about the biggest challenges uh, facing Indigenous clean power projects in BC? Well, I'll just say a, a little bit uh, here. And um, so I, I sit on a number of different uh, advisory uh, panels, uh, uh, committees, uh, and work uh, um, in a 2020 Catalyst program, mentor uh, Indigenous uh, clean energy champions in various communities across the country. Um, and and uh, the situation in BC with BC Hydro um, uh, is clear in British Columbians' minds, but it's true across the country. And it's, in, in my view, uh, one of a um, um, result that finds Indigenous people pushed out of the economic picture. And there's always a reason for that. Uh, in BC, we have uh, Site C, um, uh, and that's the reason. Uh, in fact, what, what uh, uh, if you zoom out of that, um, you know, the history of this country has been one of pushing Indigenous people out of the way, out of the economy, just out. And when there needs to be a focus on bringing and supporting Indigenous involvement in community, in, in economy, in our society, uh, in a fair and equitable way. Uh, despite Site C, the scale of the projects, the Indigenous projects uh, in uh, British Columbia are such that it's a small little bit in the overall uh, economy in the overall energy production in British Columbia. These are conscious decisions that people are making. And I can guarantee you that the people making those decisions, not one of them is an indigenous person, not one. Because if there was one there, that person would be saying what I'm saying and what any other person who has been pushed out of these things generationally would say. Melina, do you want to speak to this? You, you touched on this earlier, but um, you know the Site C Dam is obviously the major obstacle in the sense that BC now says they don't need any more, any more power. Are there other obstacles or challenges that you see facing the, the communities that you visited? Yeah, I feel like um, what we're really missing both in BC and across Canada um, is progressive renewable energy policy. Um, if we actually had progressive renewable energy policy, I think we would see the ability for communities to get involved in the renewable energy in the renewable energy sector. Um, I think we need to see more implementation of training program pro programs that are accessible to Indigenous peoples as well as non-Indigenous peoples to transition our workers. Um, we need to see resources towards implementation of renewable energy projects and ensuring that there is fair and equi equitable power purchase agreements when these types of um, renewable energy projects go up as well as fair and equitable procurement agreements um, in renewable energy projects. And I think these are the types of things that need to be taught both to communities 
communities, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and um, push towards uh, the government um, when, we, when we see that. I think in a couple of the comments above, I saw that, um, that from my understanding of the, of, of the comment was that there was an interest in renewable energy technologies, but what I've seen every Indigenous community that I go to, elder, youth, young person, people are extremely interested in renewable energy system. In, renewable energy is a lot more in line with Indigenous ways of being and thinking of having a regenerative type of technology that generates energy from the sun, from a type of energy that's more infinite as opposed to finite, which we see where I'm from in the Alberta tar sands. It's an, it's an not, it's a finite resource and it has immense impacts to our land, air, quality, ability to breathe. And that's why we put up solar in our project, in our community and, and put up a solar project that powers our health center to ensure that young people, um, you know, there's so much interest. And so when we go back and do energy literacy programs with the young people, the grade fives and six are always putting their hands up. And so we need to bring about energy and asking about solar and they're interested about it and they talk about what happens when the sun doesn't shine they're thinking about it when the when the light um, switches on and off but if we don't um, bring about energy literacy or climate literacy training and programs and workshops into our educational systems I think that we're going to continue to see um, the our society's inability to actually adequately address climate change thank you for that we're going to open things up to, uh, to a Q&A in a moment. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little button that says Q&A, and you can um, pop your questions into the, the window there rather than putting them into the chat box. And, uh, and we'll be able to get as many of those questions to Melina and Peter as we can. So while we wait for folks to type in their questions, I just wanted to put one more to you, which is what can we do? What can people who are watching this, uh, this webinar do um, or people in the broader uh, community of folks who are, who are concerned about climate change and want to see more action um, from our government. Are you seeing um, things that are working? Are you seeing things that people can support uh, in order to help accelerate um, the transition that we all know needs to happen and the, um, the empowerment that Peter talked about um, by Indigenous communities participating in the economy on their own terms uh, in ways that benefit all of us? Um, I think, you know, um, I, there's a, a struggle in my mind about, um, you know, what can people do? Uh, because the way the conversations are often framed um, uh, is a little bit us and them. You know, how do we help Indigenous people? How do we help uh, uh, Black people, Black Lives Matter? Um, and and it, it's my struggle that I'm I'm really challenged to reconcile. Um, so there's a little bit of framing around that uh, for me. In but there's no question that um, at the end of the day we're all Canadians. Uh, we need to think uh, about each other as uh, our family. If it was our family member who was, uh, you know, suffering uh, as uh, black people are in our society or indigenous people are in our society, what would we do? If it was my brother, my sister, my mother, um, who was suffering the consequences of being shot uh, five times in a wellness check, what would we do? And to, to think about uh, the issues in that way, um, would be helpful and and people will be inspired to figure out what they can do the the emotional connection to the struggle uh, uh, needs to be uh, um, ingrained in, in, in each of us as Canadian citizens as we proudly boast about how great a country Canada is if we think about my sister just got shot five times on a wellness check we might not be boasting about how great a country Canada is. So we need to frame things ourselves to think about what would I do? What can I do to change that? Um, and, and a big piece of that uh, for me is empowering Indigenous people um, to be able to make their own decisions, to help themselves help themselves. Um, the, these, that connection and having Canadians understand, you know, as Melina talked about earlier, about what, what our true history is. 
talking the truth. Uh, you know, in our Indigenous communities, often we are not honest with ourselves about what our own capacity issues are. And we need to do better about that. We're doing some very difficult work at home here in Tuck River Clinic at Homeland about that right now. Yeah, these are challenges, but you're not moving forward unless you take on those challenges, work through them. And, uh, you know, as, as Canadians, this is hard, you know, to think about my sister just got shot five times on a wellness check. Think about that. How the heck do you deal with that? And yeah, anyway, so that, that, that's what I think. Thank you. Melina, did you want to add any of your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this is the, the amazing thing, but also the sad thing. I think there's, there's, we're holding two pieces here of we're trying to uplift the leadership of Indigenous communities in the transformation of their communities while they're still reeling from colonial genocide. And I think these are the realities that Indigenous communities hold every day. It's a lived reality you know, of, of all of us, myself included, as a, a, ma a family member of a murder of missing women, we do not have justice within our families, we do not have justice within our communities, but yet we are still looking at ways to rebuild our communities. Because when the social fabric of Indigenous communities and Black communities have been dismantled by colonial policies that are very, you know, if, if you look at the history of the Indian Act and all of the different um, colonial policies that have really detrimentally impacted Indigenous and Black communities, it has been, it is something that communities are still reeling from. And that's why you see communities still in crisis. And then you top that with what Peter is talking about with an Indigenous woman being shot five times um, during a wellness check, that we do need better systems. and. Um, either defunding the police or looking at better ways to bring about restorative justice in this country because we know that um, unfortunately when people are culturally insensitive and of in, especially in a trained police force that that does not benefit indigenous communities and communities of color um, it just actually creates more unsafe conditions for communities to um, yeah have a proper wellness check being done um, so I think it it there's a really big issues and um, we're still healing from them. And that's what we, that's why we talk about decolonization and decolonization is not just for indigenous peoples. It's for Canadian peoples as well, because it's really about learning the history of this country that's been kept out. Like I said, of the story of the story books of the history books and, um, and looking at how do we reconnect to mother earth? How do we reconnect from these systems um, of, cause we have these colonial systems of patriarchy and we, um, we are not benefiting from them when we disconnect ourselves from Mother Earth. And so that's what Indigenous philosophies are of the reconnection of Mother Earth and becoming a part of that sacred circle again of all our relations. And so I think it's, it, these are deep questions and it's hard to go in between all of them because I know we are in limited time. And, and so we're going from techno technological questions of renewable energy systems to you know, um, more historical and current still current um, colonial histories that we're still grappling with. Um, so it's a big question, but I'm happy that Dogwood is willing to take it on for its audience and that we can actually talk about these histories because that is how we really continue to heal and um, turn a new page in this country. Thank you both. We're gonna get into some of the questions um, from audience members. And I wanted to start with one from Nikki in Smithers. And she asks, um, Peter, was the goal to come off of diesel in Tacker River Klingit territory part of the land use plan? Or was it outside of that process? Yeah, it was outside of the process. It, uh, it uh, um, somewhat parallel, um, uh, but outside the process. There's a couple more questions. People are really interested in the specifics of, uh, of your first Run River Hydro project. Um, wondering if it's fed by glacial water, where it is, the head and the flow, how long are the transmission lines? We're getting some very specific questions. Wonder if you can just tell us a little bit more uh, in detail about your first uh, project and, and perhaps the expansion. Uh, yeah, so uh, both projects are on the same creek. Uh, it's called Pine Creek. It flows between uh, Surprise Lake or in uh, Klingy language, Kusawa Lake, uh, which means Long Skinny Lake. It's 32 square kilometers has a natural uh, uh, annual variation of uh, 1.1 meters. 
Uh, we hold the water for our existing project uh, a little longer uh, in the lake, but within the natural variation uh, and uh, generate uh, in the north, uh, most of the energy is consumed in the winter months. In the summer, it's always sunny and people are outside uh, and so don't use much energy. Um, it's just a localized grid. Um, uh, so the, the, the new project will be on the same creek. Uh, we'll uh, have 170 meters of head on the upper project as opposed to 100 that is for the existing project. Uh, the lower project will have 55 meters of head, 92 kilometers of transmission. Um, I can't remember what the other detail question was. Storage, um, people were curious about storage. I guess the storage is the, lake. Is the lake, yeah. Yeah, the, so the storage is a lake and it is not glacial fed. Okay. Um, Tom has a question. Uh, he asks, as unified indigenous peoples of BC, what can we collectively do to insist that BC Hydro purchase electricity from small scale green energy projects? Thoughts on, on that collective front? Well, I think the summit is, uh, is a uh, place where that uh, question might be best answered. First Nation summit. Yeah. And I think also too, for um, just, I don't know, like, I think we need like an awareness raising campaign because I, I don't, I myself who was, has been very critical of Site C from the get go because I'm from the peace country on the, on the Alberta side and Treaty 8, which is a shared territory, there will be impact um, to all of our shared territories, more so closer to the, the site of destruction of where they're taking down, um, you know, farming lands and, and indigenous um, um, sacred sites. But also, um, I think it would be so great if we did have a bigger awareness campaign that, you know, th that it is not bringing about energy democracy to Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities that want to become energy autonomous or energy secure. Um, because one of my concerns is with, with this Site C is that what if there's a massive forest fire and it cuts off the transmission lines and so it, and it breaks that, that transmission line to a lot of other communities. But if we have autonomous regions where communities are connected to grid because they're, develop, they're producing their own energy, I think for me that makes them more energy secure um, history, um, a future in, in a better one than our history. So I think, I just think there's, there is potential campaigns that could be um, developed from this idea that more people need to know that, that, that communities cannot connect, connect to grid. So I think that is such a great question and that could be a campaign and a petition in itself. Um, yeah, and I also wanted to mention really quickly too, because I've been to Peter's community, is that they've not only done run of the river, they've done a geo exchange system as well as a produced amazing buildings that are energy efficient that are just gorgeous and so you can see that actually in power to the people we didn't have enough time to show the whole episode each one is 22 minutes and it's jam-packed full of so they're half an hour shows but yeah please tune in because they're worth worth seeing all of peter's um beautiful amazing work with all of his other community members that we interview yes i will i will echo that seeing how all of these things integrate and fit together and how for example a a, a project a contract with hydro can provide revenue to invest in other programs and priorities and infrastructure. It's, uh, it's really amazing to see after a few years um, how that can transform a community. Um, a question from Constance, and she wants to know if she's speaking to her MLA, if there are specific policies or legislation or programs um, that she can encourage her MLA to support on the political side. Well, I'll just say in my early days at uh, Taku River Tinket, I was involved in some of the politics and uh, negotiation of land use plan, things like that. As hydro uh, developments um, uh, continue to take more of my time and uh, some of the other infrastructure um, investments, I, um, I, I have no capacity uh, left. And so that stuff um, is uh, our policy, our political people at the First Nation and other First Nations uh, is uh, my, where I defer not to. Division of I labor, agree. makes yeah, sense. I, 
yeah, we can't do it all, but yeah, I agree. It's, it is, it is asking for progressive, robust, renewable energy policy that actually exists as a standalone policy within BC. I think we've seen it, you know, as from examples in the past that currently don't exist anymore through in the green energy act in Ontario, which allowed for communities to be able to bring solar and solar farms to their communities. We do visit to six nations and power to the people. And you can see just because of that green energy act, how communities were able to bring to scale um, wind and power, wind power, solar farms, and solar farms, as well as wind farms. So it's, it's when there is a progressive renewable energy policy that exists, it does allow an usher in renewable energy systems. But communities have also done it in other jurisdictions where they didn't have progressive renewable energy policy, but they worked super hard to be able to imp implement. But I think this is the type of policy that we actually need to see that is inclusive of Indigenous ownership and Indigenous equity and participation. Um, and that means an immense amount of ownership, not 1% that we've seen from some other projects, um, but also like 51%. So we're talking about actually um, ownership and participation um, that is meaningful. I'll, I'll speak to a couple of programs constants um, in BC. There's the standing offer program, which was abruptly canceled by BC Hydro, left a lot of communities hanging after they'd made investment decisions on renewable projects. And that was a political decision. Um, so that is a decision that could be reversed. And so reviving the standing offer program and signing energy purchase agreements with indigenous communities is something that the government could order BC Hydro to do. Um, there's also net metering at a residential scale and at the scale of a small sort of neighborhood solar co-op. And BC Hydro is right now trying to roll back the net metering program, reduce the rates and make it economically unviable for residents and consumers to generate their own power and, and pay off their own solar panels over time. Um, I'll also mention a, a policy idea, which has come up on our big uh, map of projects for a better BC, and that is um, climate action financing also known as PACE or Property Assessed Clean Energy. And this is a, uh, a financial instrument uh, basically that allows uh, communities or buildings or people to borrow uh, the money up front for things like heat pumps and solar panels and then pay down the cost of that infrastructure over time through the savings on their energy bills. And so that can be a way for a school or a library or community building um, to make the changes now that will contribute to better indoor air quality, that will contribute to less energy use and GHG uses, but spread the cost out over, over 15 or 20 years. And so that is, a, again, a piece of legislation that the BC government could bring in. And um, you, can, uh, you can find out more about these programs at uh, localpower.ca, and that's Dogwood's campaign um, around uh, democratizing uh, energy in BC and uh, kickstarting the clean energy transition. Uh, we have time for just a couple more questions. And so, um, Melina, I wanted to throw to you, there's uh, a couple of folks asking, why haven't I heard more about this show on the mainstream media? Why haven't I heard, uh, you know, Melina interviewed uh, in, in the mainstream and, and what can I do to watch the show, uh, you know, if I don't have cable? Yeah, so you can, so if you don't have cable, you can watch it online, um, I think for at a price of $4.99 a month. So cut price of a cup of coffee, if anybody still gets coffees these days. Um, so streaming online, Lumi service is called L-U-M-I, Lumi. Um, it's an APTN um, streaming service. So you can find Power to the People as well as an other amazing Indigenous content for $4.99 and you can just watch watch it all um, if you need to find some good, more binge-worthy material. Um, but yeah, so there's 13 episodes um, and power to the people I just put also yeah there's the website um, power to the people TV to get more information and you can find the Lumi streaming service there and more information about all the different episodes that we talk about all the different communities that we visit so you can definitely go there and yeah it's been a little bit disappointing to be quite honest and this is this is once again the kind of the issues that we're talking about of indigenous stories not being valued as much as non-indigenous stories and for me um, we, we put out a press release we told all the mainstream media that this TV show is up and running and you know we got very few bites but when we put out like I've you know I've been a campaigner for many years and when you put out bad news stories you get lots of bites you get lots of calls and I you know we had a massive oil spill back home it was just like my phone didn't stop ringing for two two weeks and I'm happy that they covered it but I'm just also interesting when we put out the good news stories the good things that are happening in communities the healing the regeneration the, all of the things of 
quote unquote reconciliation, we don't see um, as much um, coverage. And I think that's been really disappointing. And um, yeah, so if, for folks that are watching, um, you could, you just, you, I think I saw somebody here that they said they would check in with their local CBC um, radio show, but yeah, send it over and say like, why aren't we seeing this covered? Because, and let APTN know that you also enjoy it um, too. That's one thing that if, if people here, even on Dogwood, once you watch the episode episodes and you like the power to the people and you want to see more content like that, write APTN as well and say, we want a second season because these are, the more that people know that there's more of a buzz, um, the, it's better, but it's just, it has been disappointing that Indigenous media is not supported as much as sometimes non-Indigenous media, and we don't ask, obviously have as much funding, um, but we have tried as much as possible to promote it, but so thank you for tuning in even today on Dogwood, and thank you Dogwood for um, hosting us to be able to let your audience know about that this TV show exists, and it's, it's meant to inspire people of all ages and all different backgrounds, because these are the types of stories that I want to see on the media, um, instead of all the not so great ones that sometimes really hurt your heart. So we're going to see the good ones too. Well, I can, uh, I can heartily recommend the show. And Melina, you said there's at least 2,300 projects up and running across Canada, um, which means that there's no shortage of content for, you could do 10 seasons, you could do a hundred seasons uh, and not visit all of those communities and all of those projects. So, you know, an unlimited well of, uh, of inspiring um, stories and, and, you know, real concrete examples that other people can take inspiration from depending on uh, what resources they have available in their territories or their part of the province, because geothermal might work in one place, wind might work better in another. And so I would say this show really gives an incredible overview of just the range of technologies that are viable in Canada and the people, uh, showcasing the people who are driving these projects forward. So we are coming to the end of our hour. I wanted to thank both Melina and Peter again for making time. And I will commit to sending all participants an email with the links that you've been asking for in the chat. Um, I was gonna create a little slide uh, to put up at the end here, but it's hard to copy the URL down off of the screen anyway. So we'll send you a follow-up email with the Power to the People website, with Peter's uh, Tacky Wild website, with the Local Power site, and um, a couple of other resources for you as well so that you can uh, watch the show, check it out, um, connect with Peter and Melina, and, uh, and take action if you want to help to drive this conversation forward and help push the BC government towards the kind of progressive renewable policy that uh, Melina is talking about and to, uh, and to, to respect um, the, the leadership and the, the drive that Indigenous communities are bringing to the uh, energy transition and to integrate those, uh, those projects into the larger energy picture in BC. So thank you to both of you. We'll say goodbye for now and uh, we'll send an email to folks following up. Good to thank you very much. Thank hi, you. hi, thank you so much. And thank you, Peter, for joining me. And so much respect for you. And thank you, Kai, really appreciate Dogwood. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Bye guys.